On, uh, I do believe our uh, video, it is Joey Fellingate, Senator of Mississippi District 41, Chairman of Judd B., Vice Chair Medicaid. Good morning, sir. How are you? Hey, good morning, Paul. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm guessing that you are in your office and, and not at you home. You got it. We got a Judd B. meeting at 9 o'clock this morning, so <laughs> I'm trying to do double duty this day. Well, I, I appreciate that. Look, I, I, I didn't know if you had a chance to hear the Speaker of the House just a few moments ago and talking about some things. If you did, then uh, any response to any of those, if you had a chance to hear? I heard just a tidbit. Let me just say, I am a huge Jason White fan. He and I were in law school together back in the day, mm -hmm. and um, I followed his career through the legislature with great admiration, and he's one of the good guys. So I'm, I'm thankful you had him on, mm -hmm. and I heard just a tidbit, but really... I was telling my boys um, good morning on the other line, so I didn't hear all of it, to be honest I got with you. you. I do want to ask you about the same things, basically, and, and uh, what it looks like in the Senate, because with the there is a deadline today, and some things need to go sure. to conference if they are. But give us your take as far as uh, any of the, the, the top bills in Judd, in Judd B. Well, we've got a, a good list of bills in Judd B. One of the things I think you've talked about with me before is allowing for mm -hmm. electronic signatures of judges on things like search warrants and things of those natures. You know, we're in 2024 these days, and the idea that sometimes an investigator has to travel, you know, four or five counties over in a district um, to eyeball a judge, you know, face to face to get a, a warrant signed or a search um, warrant signed is really sort of archaic. So we're trying to come up to the modern days with the technology and we're gonna bring out a bill this morning in Judd B. If the committee thinks well of it, that would allow for like FaceTime or Zoom like we're doing this morning. So you can still get the sense of the person, you know, making application for a search warrant. Yeah. The judge can, you know, ask the tough questions and see the body language, but um, you can't, require them really um, to come an hour out of their way and then an hour back to their home county to then serve the warrant. So we're trying to modernize uh, law enforcement. I think that's important. Um, so that's one of the bills that we're doing. Um, some things that you wouldn't think of that uh, we're still having to deal with like DHS investigators when they're on a sting and they're trying to find the bad guys and search people out. Right now they don't have the ability to search with an unmarked car. So the DHS investigator drives up with the DHS markings on the car and trying to do a stakeout um, and do a sting operation. They legally can't do that right now without being obvious as to who they are. So we're gonna try to fix that little quirk in the law this morning, so that's another one. Um, one of the things that we've uh, bandied about a little bit, and I think we're trying to get to uh, a happy medium, um, is that on the Mississippi Board of Law Enforcement Officer Standards and Training, we're trying to figure out a way where, like with the Rankin County situation that we're all aware of, where you have a, a bad actor in law enforcement that needs to be investigated. You don't necessarily need the person like the sheriff or the police chief necessarily doing that investigation because you know perhaps this or perhaps they're involved themselves. And you want a new set of eyeballs looking at that situation to make sure that, um, you know, people in law enforcement, and by and large, they, they do it anyway. But we want to make sure that there are bad actors in our law enforcement community, that they're, um, you know, studied, examined, investigated by that's not necessarily already biased in their favor or maybe even involved with them yeah. in the bad actions. So work on an amendment to that bill to try to get um, a little more teeth and a little more investigative powers at the um, the right places. Is 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 that as as each police off each police uh, department having its own internal affairs, or would that be a board of uh, with a, a statewide overview? I thought of a statewide board, and you know the the statewide board is the one who issues a licensing for law enforcement. So mm -hmm. they're really the only ones that can pull the license. And so right. I really feel like that's the place it probably should be housed. And again, these are few and far between exceptions. By and large, our law enforcement community does a great job of self-reporting and of self-monitoring, but there are you know, exigent circumstances where that system obviously has failed badly in our state, and we need to correct that. I, uh, it's, there are so many bills going through here. I'm trying to think. I mentioned your name yesterday or 
uh, maybe it was on Monday, when you had an amendment that failed in one of the bills. Sure. And what was that? I, I forgot what I'm trying to call up the number. I have no idea. I think it was the Medicaid bill in the Senate, and I offered a couple of amendments maybe yes. to try to strengthen that bill. Yeah. Yeah. You want to you want to elaborate on that? Well, you know, the work requirement I'm a huge fan of, and I'm so thankful that the Senate leadership saw fit to place a very strong work yes. requirement in the bill. But even in that very strong work requirement language, there were a couple of exceptions to that work requirement that I thought maybe could be abused. Um, the main one being you could get a doctor to sign um, a it. document essentially yeah. stating that anybody and of course, we're talking about able-bodied, working-age people here. That's the population we're talking about enlarging to. So for any able-bodied, working-age individual, the current Senate language, if you go to a doctor, or a, I think it's called a healthcare professional, um, and they say, well, you're not really able to work because of physical, mental, you know, emotional, whatever, um, it basically is, I think, a, a loophole that can, can be um, used to get around the work requirement. And so I offered an amendment to strike that exception. It failed. But anyway, you know, I trust the legislative process. I thought it was worth offering. I thought it would strengthen the Senate bill. Um, but, you know, my colleagues didn't see well to advance that, and that's fine. All right. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the former speaker, Philip Gunn, spoke highly on, uh, about that yesterday, saying that uh, he thought it was a good requirement and it could be misused. Oh, I do want to ask you this, though. If it is actually a, a case where that person does have a medical situation, how is that validated right. then? Well, you know, we have a situation already in law where if you are truly disabled, there is a whole system in place where you go and apply for disability, for SSI disability on the federal level, okay. but you do it in the states and you get considered automatically for Medicaid coverage to, in fact, prove your case to the disability judge. So we already have a working disability system in the state and across the country, to be quite honest with you. So I felt like the, the language was redundant and really watered down and did away with a need for a whole disability system. If you're just going to allow any practitioner out there in the state to write you an excuse and say you don't need to, to work to receive these Medicaid yep. benefits. I think you see the same thing as far as the medical marijuana or even vaccinations. Uh, there are some concerns on that. Sure. Are you in any of the meetings today that deal with PERS? Well, um, I sat in on about a week and a half ago when uh, Chairman Johnson, who's, who's fantastic, they held his government workforce meeting about two and a half hours. We heard from three of the active PERS board members who I thought mm -hmm. did excellent. And they're calling another meeting this afternoon. So I think that it's very possible that there will be a bill that will come potentially out of that committee. I'm not personally on that committee, but I did sit in and listen because I thought it was so interesting and important. So I think the message, though, coming out of the Senate um, regarding PERS, and you've heard it over and over again, and it's true and it's worth repeating, no proposal that I've heard talking to any of my colleagues or the leadership here in the Senate want to do anything that would water down or diminish yeah. benefits for current retirees or people currently in the system. Now, moving forward, prospectively, there could very well be a new tier created that would have less benefits than the current system for new hires, but not for anybody currently in the system or currently retired. What's your take as far as the the Inspire? Uh, ver I'll, let me, let's hold on, and, and I'll do this when we come back right after this. Uh, sure. But Inspire versus MAEP with Senator of uh, District 41, Chairman Judd B., Vice Chair of Medicaid Committee. That is Joey Fillingain. More with him coming up next. You know, talking about the personality of the 2024 legislative session, I love the, the, the camaraderie between the House and Senate. It's, it's usually antagonistic, but it is in a mild, different way. In this session, it's bless their sweethearts more, which is good. Uh, you like that back and forth saying nice things uh, about, yes, about the other chamber uh, always. Before we get to Inspire, i got to ask you this one, though. As, as far as the work requirement, that's one of the differences between the House and Senate. Uh, right. And we mentioned with uh, the Speaker of the House a few moments ago that there's been words, the, the study and some of the people saying that uh, actually the, the, the Senate plan is not as fiscally conservative as uh, the House plan. 
uh, a- AOC actually, Affordable Care Act, actually is more fiscally conservative. Y- your thoughts on that one? And I mean, as far as cost in the state. Well, my thought on that is that uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, would be a big proponent of the House plan, from what I understand, mm. the way it came over here. So I think it's um, minute, have you, have a you, plan. Have you talked to her? Well, I just know that a full expansion, although they inject with sweeteners from the federal government to say we're going to do the 90-10, plus we're going to give two 5% increases for two years, it's sort of like sugar. It's very addictive, and you get a high over it, but then you crash after it's gone. You take that sugar out of the system. So as between the two plans, the Senate plan is by far the most conservative plan of the two. It's modeled after the Georgia plan. Now, it's true that you don't get the big infusions of federal money because you're not doing what they want you to do, but we would still get our 77-23 match, which is still a very good match. And again, you know, I voted against the overall plan. I had to choose between the two, certainly Senator Blackwell and Boyd have crafted a plan that's far better from a fiscal standpoint, a standpoint than the House version. But it is very unlikely that uh, the the number of the votes over in the Senate is not going to be veto-proof. Um, I don't know. It passed with a veto-proof majority um, the last week, for sure. Now, I, I don't envy that, that was, Chairman that was Blackwell. Your bill, though. Well, I don't envy Chairman Blackwell's position because I feel like he um, did a very good job. He's one of the best members <laughs> as far as a hard worker we have in, in the Senate, I highly respect him, but I feel like he's got a, a very tight bill. And when he goes to, to conference with my colleague from the Pine Belt, um, Representative McGee, Chairwoman McGee, who I love, and it's a very fine person, he's going to have to either give some or she's going to have to give some or they're going to have to come somewhere in the middle. And I think if you move far off of the Senate position, it certainly would change the dynamics on the floor. When you, I know you see the lobbyist every single day up and down the halls there. Is the parents' campaign more in favor of the MAPEP reworking that than Inspire? Uh, that's the sense I get, but now um, I haven't heard. Why. Obviously, I don't serve on the education committee, so yeah. they're probably not lobbying me directly yet until it gets to the full floor vote. But I can tell you that um, I have a tremendous respect for Dennis DeBar. He knows more about mm-hmm. education um, than I'll ever know. And I lean uh, heavily on him and his advice and what to do. And I think he's open to, to changing the MAP formula, to tweaking it. And certainly every program needs a review every now and then. But I think what the House has done is a wholesale change of the whole formula, throwing the baby out with the bathwater perhaps. I don't know if um, the prospects of the inspired legislation on the Senate end are that good at present, but again, that's not my mm-hmm. bailing way. I'm going to try to speak out of turn. I understand it, but in, in when you start looking at it, and again, Joy Fillingame is my guest, you've, the House and the Senate, as far as past years, as far as MAEP, have kept neither the baby nor the bathwater. Well, I think if you look at the proof in the pudding of where educational outcomes in our state have gone over the past number of years, Republicans have been in charge, it's on an upward trajectory. Now, there's lots of work yet to be done, but the amount of cash we've infused into our education system through the current program, I think, is laudable. I think there's more work to be done, and no one's saying you've got to keep the same program just as it is. There certainly needs to be review and changes, but I don't think you have to necessarily create the will. I guess everybody's asking me questions like, well, why would the parents' campaign have a problem with sending more money to those who definitely need it and then not, I don't want to call them rich districts, but certainly those who can afford their own because their tax base is good and in many cases growing or exploding, uh, not to be the same in the rural areas of the state. Why would the Senate have a problem with that one? And my understanding talking to the, the, the previous guest, the speaker, that's not addressing the rewrite or the reconstitution of, of some of the language in the MAEP rewrite that the Senate wants to have. Well, I don't take advice from Nancy Loom. Uh, she's not one of the people that I lean on for education advice. She aligns more with teachers' unions and the far left of the education world. 
And so that's not where I go to to get my advice on how to vote on education matters. But I can tell you that I think the proof, the Mississippi miracle that we experienced with this over the past four mm -hmm. to eight years, I think we're on the right track and we need to continue on that track. Are we going to get any changes in the CON of the con, uh, Joey, for this session? You know, I doubt it, and that's a disappointment. Mm -hmm. uh, CON laws are very restrictive. I think they're backward looking as opposed to forward looking. And um, I'm not a big proponent of CONs. But again, I think there's a lot of moneyed interests that are invested in keeping the current system as is because they're winners and losers. And the people that currently have the CONs consider themselves winners and they don't want a lot of competition. So that's a shame and that's something we need to certainly address, in my opinion. Uh, anything else? Because we're getting to another deadline today. And uh, as far as your committee or anything else that you want to mention before we let you go here. Well, I just thank you for doing the great work that you're doing. You always keep us informed. You keep us honest. You keep us in short form. And I can't say enough good things about the great job and great work that you do, Paul. And we're so thankful well, that you're looking you, so well and that you're here with us today. So I'm yeah, very thankful. I am, I am too. Uh, every single day, and I do. Th I appreciate it very, very much, Joey. Thank God you, sir. Bless